attended Baton Rouge's Southern University, majored in sociology for three years until 1962, when he devoted all his energies to civil rights work. By 1967, he became the national chairman of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC or SNCC, and as Time Magazine wrote, and I quote, in a matter of months, established himself as a firebrand of the black movement, unquote. His political activities led to his numerous persecutions. In 1968, he published Die Nigger Die. He has appeared on hundreds of newspaper articles, magazines, TV shows, and other programs all over the world. We thank Almighty God for having him with us tonight and look forward for his talk. Without further introduction, here is Imam Al-Amin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I seek refuge in Allah from Shaitan the accursed. I begin in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. I ask Allah to guide my heart and to guide my tongue. I seek refuge in Allah from misleading and from being misled, from betraying and being betrayed into ignorance by others. There is a short surah or chapter in Quran the Arabic of which is Bismillahirrahmanirrahim wal asr Inna l-insana la fi khusri illa ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqi wa tawasaw bi sabr The English translation renders it by the token of time and through the ages verily man is a loser except those who are given to doing good deeds and who counsel each other to truth and who counsel each other to patience. Another one of the translation renders it, I swear by the afternoon man is a loser, except that he is given to doing the good deeds and who counsels each other to truth and who counsels each other to patience. It is on the basis of speaking the truth and making people aware of what the Creator has required of them in this life that one can achieve success, a salvation. The topic for tonight's discussion or talk is Islam and peace. There's sort of it is contradictory in the sense that the and should be removed because Islam is a source of peace. Islam, in some definitions, is defined as peace. It comes from the root word in Arabic, aslama, which means peace, which is also the word that gives us salah, meaning peace. As it was pointed out before, as-salam, which is an attribute of the Creator, the source of peace. So therefore, in its usage, peace has a definition. It is not arbitrary. It is not relative to what we think. But there is a given definition for the word peace. So when we commit ourselves to be, being in pursuit, pursuit of peace, we're speaking a direct kind of concept. We're saying something specific. It is in this sense that a Muslim and one who follows Islam commits himself in a certain way using the concepts that has been given by the Creator who has created all things, who has created man and has not left him without guidance, but indeed has given him guidance. Guidance in the form of the book that was revealed and the example of the prophets who brought the book and the Prophet Muhammad who was the seal of the prophets. Again, peace and is Islam. Allah says he has created for man a standard religion, a standard way of life. 
a way of life that if he were to be dedicated and sincere to, then he will have the, the benefit of peace in this life. The definition of peace as it is given by the dictionary deals with serenity, tranquility, anti-war, or in opposition of war. But is peace non-war? By the Islamic definition, peace is not non-war because in some instances, to establish and maintain peace, Muslims are required to fight. Allah says fighting is prescribed or uh, fighting is, is binding upon you, though you might dislike a thing that in which there is much favor or much good for you. So by its definition, peace does not mean non-war. The kind of peace that is spoken of by the Creator on the highest level, the sublime level, deals with peace in the sense that it is obtained or uh, achieved as a result of the work that we do in this life. The peace that one obtains in the hereafter that deals again in this sense with tranquility, it deals with serenity, it deals with resignation. But in this life, the best understanding of peace deals with struggle. For Allah says he has created men to toil and struggle. It is contentment in struggle that best defines peace. That is to be at peace with oneself, to be content with oneself because he is striving in a manner that makes sense, that gives relevance to struggle. Again, Allah in the Quran reveals, he says, and the displeasure of Allah is the opposite of peace. The displeasure of the Creator is the opposite of peace. It is in this sense that we begin to look at struggle and try to understand the struggle that we are all part and parcel of. Because again, the Creator says He has created man to toil and struggle. And that man toils back to his Lord, struggling, coming back to his Lord in a state of struggle. It is in a, a, the highest sense of struggle that when we appeal to the best within us, that we begin to understand the whole sense of struggle of man against man, the struggle that many of us are most familiar with, the struggle of man against man, the struggle against oppression, the struggle against an oppressor. This becomes clear to us because in our everyday life we are confronted with this situation. So by definition of peace, if peace meant none war, how could we struggle successfully against an oppressor? How can you struggle successfully against a tyrant? Again, peace denotes something entirely different from that. It deals with contentment and struggle. It deals with struggling with an intention, with an understanding, with a consciousness. And this is what the Creator has provided us with, a level of understanding and a program that enables us to be successful in struggle. This is what Islam is all about. For again, the Creator has said that verily He will not change the condition of people until they change that which is in themselves. That he will not change the condition of people until they change that which is in themselves. And then he gives a program that enables you to bring about the change that is necessary to change those conditions. He does not just make it rhetoric and leave it. It is not sloganeering as much of the, the struggle has been relegated to in, in many of our lives. It has been relegated to sloganeering. It is criminal in 1991 to be talking about by any means necessary as if it's a program. Or we shall overcome, or I have a dream, as if it's programmatic. It is not. You must define the means necessary to bring about the changes that are necessary to change the environment that is around you. Again, what program do we have that addresses itself to the dominant problems that we are confronted with? The oppression of man by man. The oppression of a system that thrives off of its oppression. When we look in terms of the world condition, we see that a certain character has evolved upon the world scene. And it is not an unfamiliar character for those of us who are familiar with scripture. One only needs to look in terms of the story of Moses in dealing with Pharaoh. Pharaoh not so much as a person, but Pharaoh as a character because the value of scripture, the value of the book is that it deals with character. And so therefore, the prophet, peace and blessing upon him, pointed out, he says, believe that a mountain move before you believe man can change his character. And that deals with the fact that the creator, when he created man, he created for him a character that would range from good to bad, but which he could not escape from. The man's character will always be the man's character. 
So he shows you in the stories, in the narratives that he gives concerning people who have gone on before, the character. And the character of Pharaoh was of such that he was deemed as being the lord of the stakes, a tyrant supreme. But he did certain things. And his infamy in the sense of what he did was that he was an oppressor to man. He destroyed mankind on the basis of that he thought because he had reached secular power, he had obtained secular rule that he associated it with divinity. He thought that he had something coming. He thought that he was God. He thought that he was the policeman of the world. So therefore his actions began to be in such a manner that he had no regard for humanity. So therefore Pharaoh became an example in terms of the character which was to be avoided. So when you see the Pharaonic character, it gives you a sense of understanding what is at hand. We live in a world today where the character of certain nations and certain people are Pharaonic in its essence. This is a quote from an article, and the question then becomes, I won't read the preference to it, but the question becomes, what do they have in common? And it is that Cuba, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Panama, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Honduras, Venezuela, El Salvador, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Guatemala, the Soviet Union, Germany, France, the Netherlands, Belgium, Denmark, Italy, Japan, Korea, Lebanon, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Grenada, Mexico, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Libya. What do they have in common? And it is that within the 20th century alone, Within the 20th century alone, the United States forces have attacked, invaded, and liberated or occupied all of these countries. <laughs> Within the 20th century alone. This appears in a book called War Stars, The Super Weapon and the American Imagination by H. Bruce Franklin. And he points out or illustrates within the 20th century alone all of these countries have been invaded, occupied, or liberated by the United States. So what we see is a manifestation of an attitude, a character, that feels because certain power has been invested in it, that it has associated with that power a kind of divinity. But again, what was the story of Pharaoh? It wasn't just that he was allowed to rule, with him, with just rule as he chose to rule. At some point, because of the things that his hands had sent forth, the Creator began to allow those forces that worked for him to work against him. So Allah says that he sent upon him certain signs that were evident within themselves, not only in terms of a reminder to Pharaoh, but the people who were around him to begin to illustrate the power of the Creator. Say so he sent drought upon him, and he sent blood, and he sent the locusts, and he sent death, and he sent plagues upon him. Again, when we look today, we see the same kind of signs becoming evident around the character that has become a tyrant to the extent that he, he rules in a sense as if he believes that he is divine. We look at California in which they tell us there is a five-year drought that is going on in California so much so that it has alarmed them to the extent now where they are rationing water. And they say that they will cut into the production, the agricultural water, the use of water, 50%, which means that there is a reduction in the capacity to produce produce, a food that you eat. California is one of the largest agricultural regions in this country. So when there is a cutback in food that you eat, what you're talking about is famine. Famine is one of the things that visited Pharaoh. Famine is a, a tool that Allah uses to make you aware that although man talks about his power, he cannot make it rain. He cannot make it snow. So he warns you in terms of the potential of famine. But also at the same time, there is a program that enables certain people to deal with famine. And again, this is where in terms of the whole sense of submission to Allah, the superiority of submission to the Creator becomes evident. Because the peace that one, de that one derives in understanding that his ca capacity, his ability to, su to survive famine exceeds that of the other people, the wrongdoers. Allah says that he has given us fasting that we may learn self-restraint. 
Who is better equipped to, to survive famine? A man who has to eat three meals a day or a man who can fast for 30 days? A program, a viable program that again begins to discipline and deal with certain things that are real. The whole sense of famine. A problem that is confronting not only the world but now that confronts this country. And he says, and he sent up on them blood as a sign. And when we look at the rivers and the water that was once drinkable, we find out that now, as a result of industrial pollution and as a result of the acid rain and the different kinds of waste that have been in introduced into the water supply, that they have become impalatable. So much so that there's a statistic that says by the year 2000, 25% of the known reserve drinking water will be un impalatable, meaning that it will be in unfit to drink. And Allah says in Quran, and he has created every living thing of water. You need water. And the plagues that he sent upon Pharaoh, when you look at AIDS and you look at herpes and you look at the different kinds of things that are affected, affecting mankind, these things become manifest signs that there is a disorder, there is something that is imbalanced or unbalanced in, in the world today. And how is this thing changed? How is the balance set? Again, the Creator says that He will not change the condition of men until they change that which is in themselves. And so He gives them a program that again begins to adjust the whole understanding of what you're dealing with. Because the problem for many of us is that we don't even perceive the reality about what's going on. We don't even understand in terms of the whole, the severity of the conditions that surround us. <coughs> so again, the program deals with belief. And the belief is centered around what is called monotheism, the belief that there is one God and that he has created all things and that he has sent messengers to convey in terms of the guidance that would benefit mankind. That there is one God, the center, the center theme of belief revolves around the oneness of the creator. And he gives much evidence as to his oneness. He says, surely if there was more than one God, then each God would rejoice in his own creation. That is, he would distinguish his creation from the other gods. So you might see a round moon and a square sun, but you don't see that. Everything reflects a certain symmetry in this life that bespeaks of the oneness of the creator. The law says, say, he, Allah, is one, the eternal, the absolute. He begets not, nor is he begotten, and there's none like unto him. That is the center core of belief. That is the pure belief. That is the belief of purity. That is the belief that brings about and establishes and even defines peace. And then he says as part of that code of belief that he has dispatched messengers to all of the people for all time and all of the messengers that came brought the same thing, the oneness, the unicity of the creator. So therefore, in the finality of messengerhood in the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he gave him the Quran, a book that would stand and that would deal with the character of men from that time on. So the belief that motivates, that puts into effect the practice deals with the belief in one God and that there is a messenger who brought guidance. The guidance deals with the program. Prayer five times a day. The prophet said it is prayer that distinguishes belief from unbelief. We have been trained as a result of the secular kind of training that deals with the intellect but ignores the spiritual kind of development. We have been trained to make little of the spirituality of man. And so we develop the mental aspects and we develop the, the, spirit, the, the mental aspects and the intellectual aspects. And we develop arguments against the spirit. But Allah says, and he breathed into man of his spirit. So the prophet pointed out it is prayer that distinguishes belief from unbelief because it is prayer that begins to rekindle the whole sense of the spirit. He was asked, what is the food of the angels? He said, the food of the angels is remembrance of the creator, is remembrance of Allah. So Allah has commanded upon you prayer five times a day. He said, it is prayer that distinguishes belief from unbelief. The prophet told his companions, if a man were to bathe himself in a stream five times a day, how much dirt would be left? He said, of no significant amount, that is likened unto prayer. The whole sense of an exercise, a program that begins to shape and reshape and mold the whole sense of character, that begins to mold the whole sense of ethics and morals. One of the problems in the movement in the 60s was that we had the same ethics and the same morals as the people that we say we opposed. 
So therefore, the whole sense of being able to move beyond what they had offered us was not possible because the tools that they had given us were inadequate for the struggle that we had to, uh, we had to wage. So we found out that we had the same morals and the same ethics, and this was the downfall of the society. This is the downfall of the society today, as much as it was during the time of Rome and Greece and any dynasty, any civilization that fell to its own ruins. It dealt with the corruption, the eroding of the morals and the ethics. So therefore Allah says, on the basis of remembrance of Allah, he raises men. He, don't, he doesn't make them go low. He raises them when they remember Allah in the right fashion. So he says, prayer that you may distinguish belief from unbelief. It is prayer that begins to develop the moral fiber that's necessary to be able to struggle. Everybody can fight, but everybody can't win. It's a price that you pay to win. There's a discipline that's necessary to be able to win. That moral character that has to be developed that allows you the whole sense of not transgressing against someone else and not transgressing against yourself. This is the kind of thing that has to be developed when you're serious about struggle. When you're serious about moving from one level to another. What program begins to address itself to that? It is prayer. It is Islam. It is the source of peace. So therefore, the whole sense of what the Prophet enjoined upon his companions was the establishment of prayer. Because in that system, there was a means by which you could look at the character of someone else and on the basis of it, make evaluations. Allah says on the basis of the book, he says, it is a book whereby you may weigh man's action. Unlike the Christian dogma that says, judge ye not that ye shall not be judged. He said judge, but judge on the basis of the book. So therefore, when, when someone comes with the intentions other than that which is honorable, it becomes manifest on the basis of that character because they couldn't fool Allah. You can't fake prayer five times a day from now on. Because Allah will do one or two things. He'll either drive you away from it or he'll turn your heart toward himself. So he gives you that as a means by which you may weigh in terms of the action and the conduct of people, something that we didn't have in the 60s. So therefore, the movement being based upon race or black had an open door policy so anybody with an afro could be down. And so all of the agents, you had more agents in the movement than anything else. And that was not a new phenomenon. Any government that has ruled for any period of time will always have a means by which it will try to ensure its survival. The fifth column, they will have the intelligence, the COINTELPRO, they will infiltrate the movement. It's not a new concept. Again, even in the time of Jesus, Herod, Herod who understood time said, go ye and find him that I may come and worship him also. Not with the intent of worshiping him, but in the intent of searching out and destroying. The same thing again with Pharaoh and Moses. When Moses was born, Pharaoh had a sense of time. So he sent the instructions out, he says that to kill the male and spare the female with the intention of trying to abort the movement that would be developing. The same thing in terms of what was revealed as a result of the COINTELPRO files that were revealed that Jago Hoover said to, to kill those who would be a messiah, those who would assume the position in which they could be the messiah for the masses of people. The same, same thought, the same character. So Allah gives you a means, he gives you a program that begins to deal with sorting out, with deals with weighing people's action. Then he gives us fasting. He says, fasting that you may learn self-restraint. Tatakun, that you may learn to guard against evil. Fasting, it is commanded upon you as it was commanded upon those before you that you may learn self-restraint. What is the importance of self-restraint in struggle? It has a paramount importance in struggling. Because again, it begins to discipline the emotions. It begins to train you in such a way that there is a discipline especially in the face of a society that has made unnatural things seem natural. In a society that has made virtue out of impatience, fasting teaches you patience. It is a society that has said that inst instant oatmeal, instant coffee, instant TV, everything is instantaneously. And so the prophet points out in terms of, he says in terms of the best thing, patience comes from Allah. Haste comes from shaitan, to learn how to be patient. So fasting deals with that aspect of developing the self where you can be patient, where you can, be, where you can wait. It also deals with the whole sense of what you eat and, and the, the relationship in terms of what you eat to how you perceive things. 
fasting that you may learn self-restraint. In a society in which the food as an economic decision has been so polluted and poisoned until it begins to affect the way you perceive reality. We look at food and we see certain economic aspects that have been entered into the whole production of food. What is a preservative? And why are preservatives introduced into food? When we look at the meat, there's a universal law of the creator that after an animal has been killed, within three days of the death of the animal, the meat begins to change in such a way that it makes you aware that you cannot eat it without doing harm to yourself. It begins to develop an odor and it begins to change color, it turns green. So an economic decision is made. It says, how can we ensure long shelf life on this meat? Say, so we'll embalm it. It's like you embalm a dead body. They put preservatives in it. And then they put dye in it to color it, to further fool you so the meat could have been on the shelf for years. But you, to your eyes, to your faculty, you think that it is something that is edible, that is helpful to you. So therefore, it is an economic decision that has been made. But what happens when the preservative goes in your body, which is even more? The role of the preservative is to retard spoilage. spoilage. The spoilage is promoted by bacteria, deterioration of the meat by the bacteria. The same thing deals with digestion. There are certain bacteria. The digestive process begins in the mouth, all the way into the system, into the stomach. So when you eat a meat that has preservatives in it, it performs the same function in the body that it does outside of the body. Those things that preserve it from bacterial attack does the same thing. The chemicals that are used keep the bacteria from coming in and breaking the meat down to a, to a point where the body can digest it and then throw the waste out. So what happens is that you begin to build a kind of toxic waste a kind of waste that begins to be introduced into the colon, which is the place that it is reserved or kept. And the toxicity of the waste becomes of such that it cause, causes cellular mutation. All cancer is is a mutant cell. It makes the cell become stronger than the other cells so it can devour the other cells. That's all cancer is. It's a mutant cell. And this thing is promoted because there's toxicity that is now in the body. And it sits there and it is stored. Coop, when Coop was the Surgeon General for the first time in the history of this country, introduced a report to American society saying Americans are digging their graves with their mouths. See, the greatest cause of disease in this country is, is, is gluttony, overeating. The prophet, peace and blessed be born, pointed out, he says, the Muslim eats in one intestine. He said, the unbeliever eats in seven. Overeating, and overeating bad food. The food chain is poisoned in the sense that the dye that they introduce in it, the dye they have found out that the dye, when it is cooked a certain way, it causes, it encourages or increases your chance for cancer. So therefore, that economic decision to put meat on, a, on the shelf and keep it there for a long time affects your health. It affects the way you understand and perceive things. The animal, even before he is slaughtered, they use certain hormones to stimulate growth in the animal and to make the animal reproduce out of its cycle. Economic decisions, instead of one cow a year, they can get two or three. And its basic hormone that is used is estrogen, which is a female hormone. So what happens in terms of that hormone when it is introduced through the food chain into your body? What happens when estrogen, when they, they say estrogen, the female hormone, if it is injected directly into the male, it will cause him to develop breasts. What happens when he begins to feed himself a diet of animals that have been, been given those kinds of female hormones? The male begins to get soft. He begins to pierce his ears. He begins to polish his fingernails. Bikini underwears become appealing to him. <laughs> Homosexuality is on the rise. And it is directly related in terms of those things that you eat because the hormone is not removed from the meat because it's cooked. In terms of the women, the female, the teenagers, they become sexually active because the hormone stimulates them. There was a case in Puerto Rico in which they observed the eight-year-old girls had begun to develop bosoms and the menstrual cycle had begun. And they were wondering why. So somebody said it might be something that they're eating. So they restrained them from eating pork. It was introduced into the hogs. 
they restrained them from eating it. And, and within the course of restraining them, then the condition reversed itself. And they went back to being normal eight-year-old children. But again, it shows you in terms of those things that you eat, you are what you eat. And the chemicals that you introduce into your body has a direct relationship to how you perceive things, how you see things. There are chemicals that alter your ability to reason, that alter your ability to understand and to see. And so therefore, it is a part and parcel of the, the cycle in terms of the tyrant in maintaining power, in that he does not mind that these unnatural things are introduced into your diet because it keeps you occupied and preoccupied and busy with other things. So again, the fasting aspect, what it does is that it pulls you away from that whole sense of, of feeling that you have to eat or you need to eat. It begins to make you question in terms of your dietary patterns. In Islam, the whole sense of how you eat, what you eat and how you eat is very important in terms of Islam. Many people today, they laugh because they see Muslims who eat with their hands. But look at the wisdom of eating with your hand. It is a fact that in terms of being able to eat food, one has to wait until it cools to a certain degree if you eat it with your hand. You can't pick up hot food and throw it in your mouth. But with an instrument, you can pick up food very hot, put it in your mouth, take a drink and throw it in there, and cancel the whole process of chewing and using the saliva to break the food down. So the whole sense of what Islam allows you is to allow food to cool until when the hand can pick it up. And then on the basis of that you eat it. So therefore the whole wisdom of what Allah had imparted to the Prophet as being a superior way of life, as being something superior to what would be introduced or to what men will do in the name of modernization. So he says in terms of the whole sense of fasting, he said know that there's a charity that you pay for everything. And the charity that you pay for your health is to fast. The whole sense of fasting in the spiritual aspect, in that it's a discipline that enables us to check the passions and the appetites. For a Muslim, when he fasts, he abstains from food, water, he abstains from the, the, the conjugal rights that the male has with the female, and the, the wife has with the husband, the husband has with the wife. That's important in a time when you have certain sexually transmittable diseases to be able to be disciplined away from just that kind of activity, just wandering, just jumping up and down. The Prophet, peace and blessing upon him, was asked by his one of his companions when they were out on a campaign. He says that they were concerned because being out on a campaign for a long time and the women that they were encountering, and as any man, as any man, they were concerned. So he asked the prophet, he says, well, to be chaste, to stay away from that. He says, should we castrate ourselves? He said, our castration is fasting. It takes away that whole sense, that urge, it disciplines. It is a way of life. It is one of the disciplines in being able to struggle successfully and being able to deal with the reality of the world that is at hand, the struggle that is at hand. It says, fasting, that you may learn self-restraint. A program, not just a slogan. Not something that's hollow, but something that addresses itself to your well-being, your way to understand, and your ability to fight. Charity, or zakat as it is called, a pillar of Islam, which literally means taking from that which you have as a means of purifying what you keep. Charity in the sense that it becomes a kind of practice that begins to expand the social consciousness it is the first real reaching out where outside of the family, where the extended family comes in and one begins to want for his brother what he wants for himself. Man is not benevolent by nature. It is a training. One trains oneself to sacrifice. And again, the small things of sacrifice, the money, the finances that we have, the food that we have, these things enable us to sacrifice in the sense of the greater sacrifice in struggle in which might be that we have to sacrifice our lives. But it comes as training because these are the things that are necessary to be successful. And to be able to do these things on a level whereby, again, there is a sense of tranquility, a sense of peace, a sense of being able to fight against whatever the obstacles are with a consciousness, being conscious of struggle. This is what struggle, this is what it demands to, for you to be successful in struggle. Again, when we go back and we examine in terms of the tools that we've been given with, given to fight, 
we have to discard a lot of the things that we've been given because there's no merit in it. There's no merit. Wanting for one's brother what one wants for oneself means that one has to be able to define who his brother is. The definition of brotherhood is based upon what? It is not based upon physiological characteristics. It is not based upon race. The law says that he has created the races that men might get to know each other, not that they would despise each other. The best amongst you is he who is most righteous. The companions of the prophet asked him, what is righteousness? He said, good behavior. See, the best amongst men are those with the best behavior. To be black is necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. He says, he who is not given to good deeds will not be hastened forth by genealogy, by lineage. Doesn't make any difference that you got kings and queens in your ancestry. If you can't duplicate their good deeds, you will not be successful in struggle. You will not be able to struggle. If your definition of peoplehood is on the basis of race, then you will not be successful because you will always be open to be undercut and undermined. Allah gives many narratives in the Quran to substantiate that belief is a superior bond to any other bond that he has given to man. The physiological bond, the blood bond. He says Cain and Abel were blood brothers. One killed the other based upon belief. The prophet Abraham, upon whom Allah says was Hanif, a righteous. His father was an idol maker. Based upon that, the blood ties, the family ties were broken. The prophet Noah, upon whom Allah sent the flood, the deluge, one of his sons was drowned, to which he prayed to Allah, surely you're the most just of judges because he was my son. Allah said, do not ask me that which you do not know. He was not of you, he was of the unbelievers, which shows that the blood ties, the family ties, are broken on the basis of belief. Race is not monolithic. Your people are determined by those people who believe as you believe. Because the opposition, the enemy has always been clear on that. Again, he always understood the concept that if you're going to fight a green soldier, you need a green soldier. He's never been blinded by racism, although he has used racism as a tool. When he fought Indians, he used Indians. He fought Mexicans, he used Mexicans. He fought Vietnamese, he used Vietnamese. He fought the Chinese, he used the Chinese. When he fought African Americans, he used African Americans. Because he understood in terms of it is the power of belief. If you believe in what he tells you, if you believe in his system, then you can be effective in fathering his struggle. So then you come along and they tell you, say, well, you can't use nobody but somebody who looks like you or your tribe. Some of the worst people you're going to meet going to look just like you. Pharaoh, Pharaoh wasn't no white boy. But again, the character. The character, the whole sense of belief. What is the superior belief? It is a belief that there is a creator who has created man and has given him guidance. And the guidance, again, deals with a means by which you may weigh the belief. So it is in this sense that when we talk about struggling, we talk about the sacrifices that we have to make, the excess luggage that we carry along, the things that we like to be known for, the things that we like to be applauded for. And many times they're excess baggage. So when we become serious about struggle, Allah says you have to make the change which in yourself. Severely, he will not change the condition of people until they change that which is in themselves. Until you become serious about struggle. Because this is what it takes. It takes a seriousness about it. Again, in terms of the prophet, the prophet pointed out. And the prophet was an Arab by birth, but he never presented Islam on the basis of Arabism. All Muslims are not Arabs and all Arabs are not Muslims. He never presented it in that light. It was always an open belief for anybody who would adhere to the belief. And that's the way it has to be presented at all times. Because again, this is the way that Allah instructed him to present it. So therefore, the Islam as a tool, as a means of being able to be successful, as a means of being able to establish the peace, is an essential ingredient in being able to struggle in this life. The last pillar, or the next pillar, deals with the Hajj, or the pilgrimage. Many of us are familiar with it as a result of El Hajj Malik Shabazz, or Malcolm X autobiography, the pilgrimage, in which he undertook a journey, in which Allah says it is a journey to the first house of worship that was erected for mankind. And in going on Hajj, he was able to see a vision, or to see a fulfillment of the vision that he had in dealing with mankind, in that there was an interrelationship, an interaction amongst men of all tribes and all groups, without the prejudices, without those kinds of blatant kinds of racism, without those things that he had fought against all his life. So therefore, he came back and he described it, he talked about it. The importance of El Hajj Malik Shabazz is that 
His character was of such that if he found something to be true, he would try to adhere to it. He would make it public. And he would try to adhere to it to the best of his understanding. This is the legacy of El Haj Malik Shabazz about his character. That is the thing that we have to look at in terms of his character. When we talk about him, it is not because he memorized so much of the dictionary, because he became, you know, in terms of articulate, in terms of his speech, but his character is what stands out. He was a man who, on the basis of a public image, was represented and was known for telling the truth. He was known to speak the truth. And it is in this sense that we try to, in terms of his legacy, identify with that legacy. Again, it is important that we look at him in that sense, not in terms of the worship, not in terms of leadership as it is defined by many of us, because many of us, according to the whole sense of following dead leadership. But again, in terms of America, when you look at America, America never talks about George Washington and Benjamin Franklin as leaders. They call them heroes. But amongst African Americans, we see Martin Luther King, El Haj Malik Shabazz as leaders, not in terms of those characters that have gone on before us and have set examples, but the whole sense of what a leader is, the definition, what is implicit in the definition is a kind of ability to interact. That's what leadership is being able to interact, being able to speak and be spoken to. It is in that sense that we have to begin to qualify and understand the importance of him as a character, the importance of him as a figure that has gone on and set a certain kind of example for those of us who would struggle. But again, in the sense of the program, the, the program of Islam, that by definition brings peace, that by definition is peace because again, Peace deals with being content in struggling, being able to struggle and have a sense of contentment, a sense of tranquility, because we are all committed to struggle whether we understand it or not. For Allah says that he has created men to toil and struggle. It is an ongoing process. It is a process that is unavoidable as long as you're in this life, you will be struggling in some manner. And you will either struggle for that which is right or for that which is wrong. So it behooves us to begin to understand and relate to the highest sense of what man can be and to make our struggle around those things that are right, the principles that are right. Again, the word Islam, which is translated as peace. Islam as peace gives us an understanding that peace, again, is not just, or does not just mean non-war. But it deals with being able to struggle with the consciousness and reality that certain things are expected of us. And as a result of being able to fulfill that obligation, there is a sense of tranquility, there's a sense of serenity that comes within us, even in battle, even when we fight. And that is the peace that is achievable. That is the peace that we are in pursuit of. The highest sense of peace, when there is no more toil and struggle, is a reward that the Creator gives as a result of your success in this life. It is not obtainable in this life. At no time will we reach a point where there is tranquility, where we just can lay back, where there is resonation, and we don't have to do anything. There will always be something else. For Allah says, after every hardship, there's ease. But then there's the hardship, and then there's ease. It's a thing that repeats itself. So we have to be prepared on the basis of being in this life to, to struggle in the best manner, and to be able to struggle against the oppressor, the tyranny that we find. Again, we seek refuge in Allah from misleading and from being misled, from betraying and being betrayed into ignorance by others. We ask Allah to confer upon us a look that is merciful, a knowledge that is useful, a heart that is enlightened, a tongue that is truthful, an intellect that is unerring, a countenance that is pleasing to Allah. And may Allah give us success in this life and in the hereafter. May he raise us in the company of the righteous. Again, I'd like to end at this point and, and, and entertain the questions, uh, if there are any questions pertaining to those things that I have said. If there's anything that I have said that is right, then all praise is due to Allah. The mistakes are, the mistakes are mine. If anything that I have said that is offensive to anyone, may Allah forgive me and you, may you forgive me. In ending, I'd like to point out that I know it is a common practice amongst people over here to clap and to applaud. But it, I would ask that you refrain and not do that because it goes against what Allah has instructed because the praise is due to Allah. In pl applauding or clapping, there is a verse in Quran when Allah talks about the worship that some people had on themselves 
given to the Creator. And he said it was no more than whistling and clapping. They would circambulate and whistle and clap. And he said, and it was no more than blasphemy. Again, the correct thing, if anything that has been said that makes sense, the correct thing to say is all praise is due to Allah. So and on the basis of those things, again, I would ask that there is no applaud. If there are questions, then inshallah, if it is the will of Allah, you know, I'll try to the best of my ability to answer it. If I'm unable to answer it, there are brothers here who are more qualified than I in terms of Islam, who I'm sure will be able to answer the questions that you ask. Again, thank you for coming out. May Allah reward you. question is, what is your feeling about the current war? The situation in the, in the Middle East, known as the Gulf War, is precipitated on the basis of the lack of following the instructions that Allah had put down. You have two supposedly Muslims who are embroiled in conflict and who have introduced non-Muslims on, on the side of one of them. The Islamic solution that could have been sought and should have been sought is in the Quran, in the verse in which Allah says, and when the believers quarrel, then they are to make the peace amongst them. There's an arbiter that is to come in and make the peace. In absence of this, then what they have done is that they've condemned both of themselves as being tyrants. Because the word that deals with oppressor or tyrant in the Quran deals with more than just the suppression of man. It deals with anyone who would look for a guidance or anyone who would accept a way other than what Allah has commanded. The zalimun are those who will oppress. So it is a situation that has taken itself out of the Islamic framework and has reduced itself to a secular war between two tyrants.